come back and I give the, the floor to Professor uh, Timodio, who is going to share the next uh, the next uh, panel. Mm -hmm. Marina, thanks indeed for joining us. Ready where you are. So here we are for the second panel of this conference. And first of all, I would like to thank um, Professor Giuseppe Martinico for the invitation to chair the panel, which is dedicated to climate change and sustainability. We are going to deal with a section of the agreement which has attracted particularly extensive attention and scrutiny, as we have seen in the first session of this conference. Um, indeed, the inclusion of provisions on sustainability issues renders this an innovative agreement, which covers the crucial aspects of labor rights, environmental rights, and climate change, the latter also in connection with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreement. We find in this section many general statements and commitments which need to be duly analyzed and uh, examined in order to outline prospects and challenges related to them. And to do this, we have here today two outstanding speakers who will drive us in the reflection. As in the first session, each speaker has 20 minutes and let me introduce the first one who is Professor Imad Adwan Ibrahim uh, of the Qatar University. He, he works on issues uh, related to international environmental law, sustainable development, and natural resources management. Professor Ibrahim will give us an assessment of the sustainability provisions in the agreement. So Professor Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to share fast. I guess you can see my, my screen. Uh, yes, okay. So, well, the best way to assess the climate change provisions within the agreement is to look into the agreement to understand what are these provisions and whether they make sense or not. So, uh, in, this, in this presentation, I will try to assess fast the existing provisions within the EU-China climate change agreement in that general context of the sustainability provisions that were included within the agreement itself, because they cannot be taken out of the context. So, we start. In a brief introduction, we all know the role of the EU in the climate change negotiation at the international level. Uh, the European Union has been playing a very important role in terms of environmental protection within or on the continent in the last 30, 40 years with the adoption of more and more sophisticated rules and regulations addressing uh, the environment. That, one well, would say that culminated with a great role played in 2015 with the adoption of the Paris Agreement in Paris, adopting a new environmental regulation uh, terminology, which highlights the, the role of leadership played by the EU in this field. China's role in this is emerging or coming at a later stage, I would say in the last 10 to 20 years, as China has, has witnessed a lot of environmental pollution, air pollution uh, emerging from climate change. So China has seen the impact of climate change directly, especially in places like Beijing, where uh, being outside for one day means you're smoking 40 cigarettes without smoking. So based on that, China had vested interest in being part of the climate change conversation at the international level and played a very important role also in the adoption of the Paris Agreement when a, when a uh, sort of compromise was reached between China and the US, and even when the US left, China remained, given that China understands the great impact of climate change on the country. Uh, because of all this, we could see a sort of intersection between the EU and China on climate change, because both actors are willing to address the situation, uh, which is why I would say that certain specific provisions concerning climate change were included in the agreement on investment, given both parties' priorities in this regard and then seeking to balance economic development and environmental protection. So this is the background more or less of what I'm trying to, uh, what, of the entire presentation, so just to understand from where both actors come from. So where is climate change mentioned in the, in the, the agreement? First, the very first beginning, climate change is mentioned in the preamble of the agreement. Uh, when the parties mentioned that, okay, we need to fight or we need to address what are the priority areas of the agreement, it mentions fighting against climate change along other issues, and it mentions taking into consideration international standards and agreements. So from the start, 
it seems as if both parties are saying we need to fight climate change in the general context or under the umbrella of the international community and international law and standards. This is more or less the approach it seems that is being adopted in this regard. Also, climate change is mentioned in the objectives of the agreement. So again, among many other ob objectives, climate change is mentioned there along public morals, social security, public education, social, social services. So it seems uh, climate change is not only on the outskirt or it's not given just a provision, but this, this provision highlights clearly that climate change is among the very important objectives is as considered as important as the other objectives. So it's not a secondary objective within the agreement. That's what you could understand from this kind of uh, provision. So, so far we've seen climate change within the preamble and within the objectives of the agreement. The main article addressing climate change within the agreement is Article 6, entitled Investment in Climate Change. And here we could see clearly that the article has a couple of, uh, so it's divided into two. The first part provides some sort of introduction of, of the general approach adopted. So both parties in the first part uh, make a strange or strong emphasis on the Paris Agreement and the importance of the Paris Agreement. And they also mentioned the importance of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is which was adopted in 1992. So both parties stress that these two conventions must be taken into account when implementing or when adopting any measures concerning climate change. Uh, and as well, well, this is more or less the idea of uh, until now, and that also falls under climate change mitigation adaptation. So they don't make a distinction. Obviously, one would wonder why it did not include loss and damage because this is an emerging field within climate change. Why only the focus on mitigation adaptation? So this is, uh, so here I'm starting to have questions I'm asking in general. So I will be going through the provision slowly and every sentence with it and try to understand, okay, this is a provision. And then I can ask questions, which I, so far I don't have any response to because this is how it is. I was thinking of the article that was adopted. So first question, the focus is on mitigation adaptation. Why not loss and damage? There is no there is no response because this this is very important because there's there are questions of compensation for instance. I'm trying to move. Okay. So based on this first section where they highlighted both parties that we need to focus on the general context of the Paris Agreement and the new NFCC, they start with saying that based on this, the party should effectively implement both agreements under taking into consideration national NDCs, which is nationally determined contributions where both parties committed to under the agreements. Well, I would ask here why, okay, so they, I understand they're trying to harmonize the rules between the national and international and take into consideration the international level. But then the question here is, well, what's the actual contribution of this article? If you're telling me that I, as a country or as a party, I need, I want, I need to implement the first agreement at the NFCC, I am doing it already. What's the added value? That's what I don't see. Because you're actually referring back to the international agreements. So what's the thing that between China and, and the EU bilaterally can be established on climate change? So far, it's not clear. Other questions? So these are answer questions for me. Well, you, they mentioned the UNFCC and they mentioned uh, the Paris Agreement. Well, the Kyoto Protocol is part of the UNFCC. Does this mean that the Kyoto Protocol is included within the agreement and there, is, there, needs, to, there needs to be stressing on that or not? If one wants to have an open interpretation of this, it, it may say that the Kyoto Protocol, given it's a protocol to the UNFCC, is part and it needs to be stressed on, but it's not clear. Maybe we could also, others might adopt a conservative interpretation for that. We don't know. Also, within the sustainable uh, sustainability part of the agreement, there is a focus on SDGs, all of them. The sustainable development goals. Yet on this particular article, when we discuss climate change and um, investment, we don't mention there is no mentioning of SDG 13, which is related to climate action. Climate action. One would wonder why. Because it all because they are connected at that national level. The implementation of SDGs take into consideration international agreements. So why mentioning international agreements and not mention, mentioning SDGs? SDG 13. Because if, if the goal indeed is to harmonize the action at the bilateral level between the EU and China and international agreements and international measures and instruments. 
these are the main instruments I mentioned, but there are plenty of other international instruments concerning climate change that are not mentioned. Is that does that mean that the focus are on these specific instruments mentioned and the rest is excluded, or does that mean that this provision this provision is open to interpretation and and it's like it's not exclusive? We don't know. So this is the first part of the provision. The second part, part B, based on this, the party shall promote, facilitate investments of relevance for climate change mitigation and adaptation, including investment concerning climate friendly goods and services. Of course, that includes renewable energy, energy efficient product and services, policy frameworks. That's, again, the same terminology adopted within international environmental agreements, climate change. So the Paris and NFCC, you can see it here, a focus on technology transfer, uh, which is good. So they're adopting the same terminology. Again, there are questions unanswered. The inter international agreements had many challenges when it comes to this provision. It's clear that we mentioned that there is there is technology transfer from the south to the north, or there are uh, know-how and technical or human capital as well. But these agreements did not answer very valid questions, questions of intellectual property rights. Let's say I, as a developed country, I want to uh, transfer my my innov innovation or invention concerning climate change to developing countries. What kind of rules of IPR apply? We did not know yet. Also in terms of international trade, should we adopt trade restrictive measures concerning this or should we allow, allow uh, climate change friendly technologies to fall under uh, what we call the, uh, the TRIPS waivers? Similarly to health issues, we don't know. And there is also still lack of financial human capital in many other places. So. The same issues that face international environmental agreement, international climate change agreements, are all, will also face this particular provision within EU and China. Uh, but uh, still, this did not, they both parties did not address this. Um, I'm not sure why or whether they actually thought of it. So this is the second part of the provision. The third part, finally, cooperate with the other party. So there is, there is a, that both parties stress on cooperation. And this is in regard to investment related aspects of climate change policies and other measures so the international community as well. Again, here, if we go back to this, if I will make some observations, cooperation, I mean, it's, it's always all stress on cooperation, but this is very vague. Cooperation in what sense? How exactly? How exactly? How can this be tangible? It's a, it's, it's a feel good, it feels more like it's a feel good provision to be added to see let's cooperate, which is great. The entire agreement is on cooperation. So what exactly, in terms of more specific details, there is nothing, although cooperation is important. So one would have to see in practice, what does this part of cooperation between both countries means? Because so far there is no tangible elements to take that into account. So this is so far the entire conversation concerning this article, climate change and act climate action and investment. But climate change and investment is put under a general framework of the sustainability provisions within the agreement. So how this interact with the sustainability provisions of the agreement? Before I go, I go there, I will just do a brief summary. Uh, this article uses the same language of the Paris Agreement and the International Climate Change Agreements. Yet, they don't address the challenges similarly. It has work, work, uh, vague wording, which means there's a need to elaborate more, interpret, maybe amend, depending on when these provisions are implemented, and both parties will see whether there is a need for that or not. Now, how would that fit within the general sustainability provisions of the agreement? First, there is the first article where you could see that there is a focus on international law and global commitments at the first article under the section concerning sustainability and investment. So there is a focus on Agenda 21, Johannesburg Plan of Implementation and Sustainable Development, Agenda 2030. So they are there. So that, in that sense, that fits. So focusing on international agreements fits within this global focus on international law and global commitments of both parties. So, so far, there is no problem with that. Then we start with a few articles, which I thought I thought they were relevant to this conversation. Uh, article 1, the right to regulate. So, each party recognized for the other party the right to regulate when it comes to sustainable development in the best way they see fit, taking into consideration all the factors and multilateral commitments that must be taken into consideration. So, in a way, there is an emphasis on sovereignty that each party has a right to regulate. But at the same time, it seems like there is a compromise being being, uh, being drawn between both parties. So 
yes, we will deal with climate change as long as it does not affect my other concerns or priorities or issues, which again is one of the main issues at the international level that we adopt commitments under the Paris Agreement and the parties have to implement them as long as they don't, uh, and, uh, so they have to implement them in a way that the best way they see fit, meaning taking into consideration other priorities, maybe economic development and other things. So again, it's the same approach at the international level, which, which is a pragmatic approach because both parties have other needs and considerations, but at the same time, it seems like they are diluting a bit the provisions of the agreement when you adopt this kind of language. Then there is the question of the levels of protection. This was an interesting, uh, interesting provision. There are several different sentences. I just focus on a couple of them. Uh, both parties have to adopt uh, provisions concerning the laws of policies to try to ensure environmental protections, even when in the context of investment. I found that interesting, along the other sentences concerning that as well. So that was something new to see. I never seen that directly like that within international environmental agreements. So potentially this can be used for future climate change negotiations at the international level, but as both parties in the way that they try to advocate for it, or more or less. But that's what um, I've seen in this regard. And the final article I would discuss is the multilateral environmental agreements. So this as well asks both parties that they need to implement the international environmental agreements. So that is in, in harmonization with the article on climate change, climate change and investment, because implementing climate change actions has to take into consideration international agreements. So this is an harmonization and there are no, there is no conflict or clash between this article and the article concerning climate change. So in a way, there is some sort of synergies, like existing synergies between the general umbrella of the agreement concerning sustainability and the provision, specific provision on climate change and investment. In conclusion, concerning that the agreement and the part on climate change action, it's clear that this specific provision adopts Paris Agreement language. Uh, so, or international climate change agreements la uh, language. In the same time, there's a focus on sovereignty in the general context of the provisions mentioned, general provisions and non-interference. So both parties will implement actions while taking into consideration each party's needs and priorities, and they will implement actions voluntarily while using the international community as an umbrella, which means that this entire conversation leads to a compromise or compromisory positions between both parties and on issues like climate change. My only, uh, I would say, not remark but observation further is that one would wonder why they, both parties did not adopt uh, or added a sentence concerning non-compliance provision in this agreement, similarly to the Paris Agreement, where in case one of the parties does not comply, there is a non-compliance procedure for which both part the parties encourage each other to comply in a certain way of providing financial assistance and other needs. So one would wonder why this kind of provision, which is sort of techno-political one and rather, rather a flexible one, was not included within this provision. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your feedback and your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ibrahim, for your uh, presentation, which has clearly outlined some crucial implications of the CAI rules uh, affecting the fight against uh, climate change. And now I uh, would like to introduce the next speaker, who is Professor Henrik Andersen, from Copenhagen Business School, uh, whose research interests um, revolve around the international economic law, uh, with particular focus on WTO law, uh, in the context of the rule of law and international climate change. Professor Anderson will deal in his presenta presentation with three main questions related to the CAI and climate protection. When? where and how CAI contribute to climate protection. So, Professor Anderson, the floor, is, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I could probably ask these questions also, the when, where and how about uh, sharing my uh, slides uh, with you. Um, it's always a tricky part in, in an online uh, presentation. Now, let me just ask you, can, can you see my Yes, we see. You see them? Perfect. And you still see them? Yes. Oh, very good. Very good. The exam has been perfectly passed. 
thanks very much. And, um, and also uh, thanks very much to P Professor Ibrahim um, for, for his presentation. Um, also about the, some of the vagueness. Um, that's not something I will cover so so much, but the vagueness that we have been, I would say, in general in, in international climate change law um, is is actually uh, quite an, an issue, and that's something I will perhaps start uh, with. A very very first question is: Can this uh, agreement contribute in the wider picture of climate protection? And I think. I think it it can. Uh, I might be a bit more um, optimistic here than uh, Professor Ibrahim, but I will get back to that uh, in a minute. But the vagueness that we see in international uh, climate change law is something that is a, a particular problem uh, for national courts uh, at the moment. And I should say here, I'm a reporter for the European Law Institute on a project about climate uh, justice, where we're developing guiding principles for national courts in climate change uh, cases. First of all, I would say for those of you who haven't worked much with, with climate change, what is the particular issue and where can there be some differences when we look at climate uh, change law and environmental uh, issues. And that is, if we look at, at the picture here, we see that what is happening is that the CO2 emission, it will go up and it, it will put um, a sort of a blockage in, in the atmosphere. So when the sun, the sun, it heats up the, the earth and uh, that heat, it will go out, out of the system again, but it cannot leave. Um, because the atmosphere is blocked to so get the heat in, but we cannot get the heat out. And the issues that we face uh, here, they are then, who are the sinners here and where is the harm actually taking place? Because if we have factories uh, with CO2 uh, emission, we have a lot of them, how can we relate that to a flooding or a forest fire somewhere else in, in the world. And that is the particular problem that we face with, with the climate uh, change. So the question is, where is the harm and, and by, uh, by whom? Um, and the courts, they don't have particularly good tools to work with here. There are a lot of cases, climate litigation in, in Europe right now, um, cases against states, cases against corporations, and the tools that the courts they are looking at that would be human rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Court of, um, uh, of Human Rights is also handling cases at the moment about that. It's about constitutions and the use of tort law as a public law instrument to impose reduction um, obligations on corporations to reduce the CO2 emissions. So, but that is also telling us something about. Perhaps we don't have the clear rules in uh, international climate change law here, giving the guidance to the states on uh, what, how to, to really incorporate, uh, for example, the, the Paris uh, Agreement. So it is necessary that we have some, both at private level and public level, some regulatory frameworks that can handle this. And that will both be soft law and it will be uh, hard law instruments. And they need to be integrated into this wide complex of the economic relations that we have between private actors, but also that we have uh, at uh, international level. Um, and I think that is particularly important when we look at the relationship between climate change law and uh, international economic law, how are they related uh, to, to each other? And in particular, in light of that, if we look at WTO, for example, there's not any provisions concerning uh, climate change uh, in, in WTO law, but I'll get back to that uh, in, in a minute. So um, one issue that we face when we look at economic incentives for for corporations and then the protection of the climate. That is, if we see a very rigid uh, climate uh, regime in a country, there's this risk of what we call carbon leakage. And that is where a company will move to uh, another state with 
let's say, less rigid uh, climate change law. But they will then still continue uh, contributing to the harm of, of the atmosphere with the CO2 emission. So that is also telling us, again, we need this global effort in order to, to make sure that we have an even playing field uh, for corporations um, uh, if we're going to effectively combat uh, climate change. Because otherwise, the CO2 emission would just move elsewhere. Now, um, and I think actually um, the agreement here can be quite important uh, in, in respect of being one brick of many that is needed to help somehow to find this balance between economic incentives and the protection of the, of, of the climate. So I, I will not uh, repeat what um, uh, Professor Ibram he, he talked about uh, before. He referred, uh, among other things, to to the objectives um, um, and protection of, of the climate is mentioned there, um, and also some of the overarching principles about sustainable uh, development and the right to regulate. So I'll just um, skip that. Um, when it comes to the question of why uh, include a, a provision um, uh, which basically saying that China and, and the EU, they should implement uh, the, the framework convention and the Paris Agreement because under public international law, they are supposed to do that anyway. But one thing that, that I am focusing on here, that is the, the word effectively, because what do we mean by this effective implementation of them? Now, coming back to the problem that I mentioned before, that national courts, they are facing at the moment. One issue that comes up in these cases, that is, what does the Paris, Paris Agreement, what does it say about concrete content that the state, they must do? And it, particular roadmaps that states they must take in order to combat climate change. Because one thing is that we have the national uh, determined contributions saying that within the next 20 years, a state must lower uh, the CO2 emissions by a certain percentage. It is quite often not mentioned on how are they supposed to, to do it. Um, and, and that's where I would like to challenge China and the EU here and say, if you write this into this agreement here, that you effectively will implement the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement, you need also to tell us on how you are going to be effective here. Um, so, so for me, it's I would say they need to to uh, be very concrete on what is it really they they want to uh, to do here. It might be a very wide interpretation of uh, this particular uh, provision, but nevertheless, I, I want to challenge both China and, and the EU in this respect. How are you going to be concrete if you want effectively to implement uh, the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement? Because the moment they write that into this agreement here, it will be binding on them as well, not only to implement the Paris Agreement and the Framework Convention, but to do it effectively. Um, uh, Professor uh, Ibram also mentioned uh, about promote, uh, promoting and facilitating uh, investment uh, relevant for, for climate change. I think it's a, uh, it's a very important signal to, to send, um, but I'll come back to that, what I mean by with, with that signal, it's important to, to send that in respect of not only in the China EU relationship, but on a global uh, level here. And that brings me to, to the next uh, the next one, as uh, Professor Ibram also uh, referred to the international fora. I think it's quite important actually that some of the ideas that we put into this investment agreement that they are taken beyond the EU China relationship and uh, beyond uh, and into the more international. Um, uh, 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 into the international forum. So, but let's get to my my three 
uh, question here, the when, where, and, and how, uh, well, it's agreed, the agreement agreed in, in principle, uh, issues at the moment, uh, the European Parliament, there are uh, human rights uh, uh, concerns um, that's not particularly written into uh, into this this agreement, um, but there are some concerns in the Parliament about the human rights situations inside uh, China. Then, of course, the situation with Russia and U Ukraine will most likely also have an impact on how the Parliament will see how how does China find a balance between its uh, good and strong relationship with Russia and uh, and the EU uh, here. Um, then there's an issue uh, about uh, Lithuania, restriction of goods and services from Lithuania into China, um, a case that's pending now in, in the WTO. And then finally, we heard earlier um, in some of the previous presentations, there's an, an issue um, the EU anti-dumping approach towards China, um, the distorted uh, economy uh, approach, uh, which they initiated uh, some some years uh, some years ago. Um, we heard, for example, that the EU Commission has issued made this uh, report about China and distorted economy, and in that report, there's a reference to the I. Uh, ILO, uh, International Labour Organization conventions, there are eight core conventions there. China has only ratified four of them. Um, uh, and the question is, perhaps actually through this agreement, it might actually be possible to 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 find uh, some consensus here among uh, China and, and the EU. But nevertheless, the distorted economy approach by the EU towards China, it is questionable whether it's actually um, uh, whether it's legal under WTO law, but that's an, an, uh, a question I will not uh, address uh, here. Um, I will just stick to, to the climate uh, issues. So, but there are some issues that need to be, be solved before if we can have this uh, agreement. And as long as we don't have the agreement, we will not have that break, which I find important in general in international relations concerning uh, climate prote uh, protection and in particular in the relationship between economic law and uh, climate change law. Where can it uh, can this climate provision in in the uh, in this agreement where can it have an impact? I think it can have a, uh, an impact in the Belt and Road Initiative. It can have an impact in WTO law, and it can also have an impact in international climate change law. Uh, and that brings me to how can it have uh, that impact? Now, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, it follows green. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear we me? Can. Yes. Okay, please. it's just there were some weird sounds uh, coming. Right. Um, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, it follows uh, uh, green uh, policies uh, uh, already. Um, however, if we have here in this particular agreement, a legal commitment concerning this effective implementation of the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement, then we, I would also assume that that must be taken further into the Belt and Road policies. And that is that uh, in the agreement, there's a national treatment principle and most favored nation principle. And in my understanding of it is that it would not be sufficient only to follow climate um, promoting policies in the relationship between China and EU, but that should also be taken further into all these bilateral relationships that there are currently in the Belt and Road between China and all those uh, countries outside of the EU that are involved uh, in it. Uh, in respect of uh, the WTO, um, there's no mention of, of climate protection in WTO law. We have some rules concerning oh, they've been applied uh, to protect the environment in uh, again, Article 20. Now, um, if we will see 
that first of all in the relationship between the EU and China, this particular agreement can serve as a relevant interpretative context for the interpretation of Article 20 in cases between China and the EU. But I would say it can actually be taken further because if we see that something similar will happen in other bilateral treaties, then it can also serve as a general interpretative context in other cases that are not related to the EU and uh, China. And that is, if we start to see this merging climate protection in bilateral trade or investment agreements, if we start to see them, they can reflect a common intention, which, uh, according to the other body uh, in EC Aircraft, has been sufficient to serve as interpretative context for other cases, even though that not all members of the WTO necessarily have signaled that they want to find this balance between uh, trade and climate or uh, uh, investment and, and climate. And then finally, in respect of international climate change law, it is um, a bit messy when we look at it. We have treaties um of course and then borrowing principles from uh, international environmental uh, law but in line with what i said before in respect of the wto if we start to see this pattern coming up in uh, different bilateral agreements uh, around that they will turn into a certain practice in those bilateral relations they will can eventually develop into principles of uh, of international law um, if they are widely recognized in uh, in treaties and if we take a look at round at the eu at the moment they're negotiating uh, trade agreements with uh, australia and new zealand uh, new zealand just as examples then we see actually that they are also now writing climate uh, provisions into those trade uh, trade agreements. So for me, it's it's we start to see a pattern where the EU is writing climate protection into the uh, into the bilateral agreements and a practice that hopefully will develop around that will could potentially reflect uh, international climate change law and hopefully also provide some more concrete dimensions to some of the questions that are raised initially on how should national courts handle uh, climate uh, cases. So in all, what I will say is that I think that this agreement, if, uh, if it's ratified, that it can be a quite important break, and hopefully we'll see it in others, that the, the protection of the climate will be put into bilateral agreements and that they can start to take some shape on the concrete or the lack of concrete elements that we have in, in the Paris uh, Agreement. Thank you very much. That's all I had to say. Thank you, um, uh, Professor Anderson. Many thanks for your comprehensive presentation. Uh, which offers several relevant elements uh, to answer the fundamental questions raising about CAI and climate protection. Uh, I don't see questions at the moment. I have a comment, uh, uh, if I may. Um, I, I think that uh, this agreement calls us to work uh, uh, in a multi-level and also multidisciplinary perspective. We have already um, a background framework, a complex network of rules which are part of the scene. Uh, just think about, uh, for example, the cooperation programs between European Union and China on emission trading system. We have several cooperation programs between European Union and China and also between some member states. For example, Germany is one of the most important European states which has a well advanced cooperation program on ATS. But also, for example, think about the tort law rules that has been mentioned 
in the last presentation. We know that the environmental tort law rules, which have been introduced in the 2007 Chinese tort law, has been, have been strongly influenced by European rules. And we find now these rules in the new Chinese civil code. So I think that this agreement uh, has uh, very general statements that need to be uh, to be more detailed but i think that also we uh, need to um uh, to have a, a, a comprehensive view of what is already the complex set of uh, uh, regulations which is behind this agreement and i think that we, I mean comparative lawyers and international lawyers, need now to start working together in order to uh, have a, a clear and complete and comprehensive idea of what uh, already exists. And I think that this is a good basis to give a more concrete meaning to the general statements. Something already exists. Uh, and okay, I see uh, it was a, a, a comment. I see a question arriving from uh, Barbara Verri. Uh, I will read the comment. Barbara is here with me, and so she does not um, open the mic uh, in order to avoid the distortion. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a, a question to both speakers, right? Okay how the provision regarding the commitment to effectively implement the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement is related to the provision regarding the mechanism to solve disagreement on Section 4? Do you think that this mechanism could be effective in case of violation of obligations rising from the UNFCCC or the Paris Agreement? Who would like to start answering? Um, yeah, well, I, I, um, I would like to, yeah. Um, I, first of all, I, I think that um, the mechanisms that we have in, in the framework convention and not much in, in the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, some questions could come before the International Court of Justice, which is a very, very lengthy uh, period. There's also some options for, for arbitration, but nevertheless. So when we look into a situation between EU and China and this particular agreement, then um, I would say, yes, well, the agreement clearly stipulates that, that both parties must uh, comply with the, with the framework convention and, and the Paris agreement. So they could take issues related there. If one of them uh, doesn't comply with it, could take it into to the dispute uh, disputes system of, of the agreement. So it, it could be one place to, to do it. So I would say, yeah, yes, was that the question? If you, they could take to solve disagreements, it is a possibility. Um, Uh, that's a tricky question, actually, uh, because the Paris Agreement, more than actually the UNFCC, is made in a way to facilitate compliance. In fact, the drafters of the Paris Agreement took into consideration that the parties might not comply so that to adopt a provision within the agreement called non-compliance. So that because the parties, there is an expectation that the parties will not comply. Uh, so, under this, if I'm trying to see to, to like connect this to the EU Chinese agreement, let's say one of the parties do not comply, then within under the provision of non-compliance, there is an entire procedure where one of the parties can be brought before the cops of the, the council of the parties. They, prov they are provided with financial technical assistance in a way, in a nice political way to help the party support its compliance in a progressive manner. So it's made in a way to prevent this to prevent disputes because uh, by the end of the day, it's the state who implements an agreement. So I'm not sure 
trying to be to have hard law on this, trying to bring one parties before a court is actually more helpful because as we have seen earlier, for instance, in cases between China and Philippines in the Southeast China arbitration, uh, Philippines brought China before the arbitration court concerning the, the, the sea there, China did not attend. There was a court ruling against China, China didn't care. So that's the question is what is more effective, having a, having a hard stringent regulations and bringing the party to the court or having the same way that Paris Agreement is using non-compliance. And I, I would think, that the, that the latter more flexible approach is much more adequate. Thank you very much for your answers to this complicated question. Um, okay, we took the occasion of having you <laughs> in this panel <laughs> uh, to raise uh, this question. And if no other questions uh, are uh, in the chat, and I don't see any other question. I think that uh, I can um, thanks uh, a lot uh, uh, our speakers and uh, leave the floor to Professor Martinico for his final remarks. Thank you. Uh, thanks indeed, um, Marina, and thanks to the speakers, to Imad and to Eric for this uh, very rich panel. And um, I, I took a lot of notes. I mean, they, I think that this uh, agreement can serve, as Eric argued, as a kind of lab also to, I mean, test and to trigger, I mean, some possible solutions that, of course, I mean, need to be implemented also at national level. But I think that it, it is a very, there is a potential there. And, and um, I, I did, I mean, uh, find all this, uh, Kind of analysis very fascinating. Uh, since we are running out of time and and we have had a very long uh, but very useful I would say morning, I will limit myself to just I mean a couple of uh, a couple of remarks. Uh, this is the the fourth uh, the fourth conference jointly organized by the Santana Legal Studies Program and the Confucius Institute. Of PISA, I I really hope that there will there will be other uh, possibilities for for cooperation, and I think that this is indeed an ambit which uh, can be explored, and uh, we really need to have uh, other uh, opportunities, other chances like this in which we can involve. Uh, scholars uh, from different jurisdictions, you know, that to exchange uh, their thoughts on this uh, very complex uh, issues. Also, I think that we really need to, um, in a way, I mean, focus our attention perhaps more on the uh, national phase of implementation, not this uh, international phenomena. I mean, I I'm referring here to the, uh, of course, I mean, to the, to the comprehensive agreement, but also to the uh, bilateral the, the agreements that uh, have uh, characterized so far the Better Road Initiative. I mean, we don't know much at, um, uh, we, we don't know much about what, what, what is happening at national level, but the national level is, of course, a fundamental uh, piece of this patchwork. So perhaps, uh, in the next conferences, uh, we will try to to do uh, deal with this uh, with this level. Of course, that, I mean uh, that we have uh, enjoyed this morning some uh, presentations given by our uh, Chinese friends. I mean, um, uh, and, and they have dealt a lot with some internal and uh, domestic legal mechanisms that have been introduced in a way to. Um, to uh, complement the, um, the strategy um, and, and endorsed by the Better Road Initiative, but uh, we don't know much about about the other countries involved with it, of course, in this in this initiative. And there will be, I mean, many other uh, possible uh, topics that perhaps uh, we will explore in the next years. I mean, the important thing is. Uh, 
uh, creating a sort of critical mass and, and to gather people, I mean, who are interested in uh, this kind of topics. I mean, the, the, that's why I think that uh, events like like this are important because they can, they can rep represent, I mean, in the first way of of a testing, I mean, the, the chemistry among us and to create the, 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 I mean, a possible desert group. As uh, also Mad, I mean, uh, showed the, 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 in, in this analysis, I think that the, the, in this kind of uh, uh, field, uh, we really need um, also interdisciplinary or perhaps uh, transdisciplinary research. So uh, going e even beyond, uh, of course, I mean, our uh, legal categories, I mean, to uh, in the, 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 the mean, see how the things, I mean, work in practice. So perhaps in, in, in the next conference, so we will try to involve also, I mean, scholars interested in in economics or in geopolitics, why, why not? I think that this is a very a promising terrain and uh, I look forward to exploring it with you all. So I really uh, hope that this will be just an, another uh, chain in a longer, Another link in a longer chain, I mean, for our future uh, cooperation. And uh, I think that um, um, we, I mean, managed to, uh, to I mean, deal with all the uh, complex issues that uh, are, of course, characterizing uh, this complex legal and political scenario. I said that at the beginning of this workshop, uh, the EU-China relationship is at the crossroads. I think that we really need, I mean, to to understand, I mean, what kind of relationship we we, we want and we need, I mean, to uh, build a better international system, and um, which is now so much polarized. Then do we need these type of bridges, and in this sense, uh, I really uh, I'm really, really happy to to say once again that the. Uh, support had by the Confucius Institute can represent an example of how, how important are cultural bridges. So, um, having said that, again, um, uh, once again, for joining us, for your brilliant uh, thoughts, and I look forward to um, the, the next workshop. I mean, thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Thank you.